All right. Well, let me uh, tell you some thoughts that I had with Marko Milanovic, which many of you know. Uh, Marko is the editor in chief of the, of the blog EGIL Talk, the European Journal of International Law Talk. And he also is part of a team that I'm also a member of that travels around the world working with governments on cyber issues. The paper itself came about because the Journal of National Security Law and Policy, I'm on the editorial board there, when the pandemic hit, wanted to put out a, uh, a special edition on COVID-19. So Marco and I took on the international law piece and that's where most of these thoughts come from. So I'm gonna talk about COVID-19 and international cyber law. I'm gonna break it up into three different parts. The first part will be about operations that target, COVID, or target medical facilities uh, during peacetime because a different body of law, of course, applies during wartime. Uh, then I'll talk about misinformation. And then I'll conclude by talking about the obligation that states have with regard to protecting people that are on their territory from these sorts of operations. So let's begin with cyber targeting of healthcare systems. And sadly, we saw a fair amount of this. These are just some of the examples. They range from going after a, a hospital and shutting down the IT network, which was particularly problematic, not only because the hospital couldn't function, but it was relatively early on in the pandemic and that hospital was one of the few hospitals operating has a COVID testing center. There were medical research facility, Hammersmith in the UK, uh, which had been designated by the British government as part of their crisis response plan, has a vaccine testing center uh, that was shut down for a while. Even the World Health Organization was attacked as there were attempts to get passwords of folks there. Fortunately, that was blocked. So we saw a fair number of operations uh, directly against healthcare facilities and capabilities. Now, what Marco and I were talking about was, of course, international law. And so we were looking for international law violations. Uh, for us international lawyers, we call these internationally wrongful acts. So something that violates international law is an internationally wrongful act in what is known as the law of state responsibility. And there are two conditions for something to be unlawful under international law. First, you have to break one of the rules. These are known as primary rules. We'll talk about those rules uh, in just a moment. And second, and this is critical, the second requirement for a breach of international law is that the activity, the operation, in this case, the cyber operation, be attributable in law to a state. Again, the rules of attribution are set forth in a body of law known as the law of state responsibility. But the two big ones are either that the actor, the individuals conducting the operation are organs of a state. There are cyber military folks, intelligence agencies, whoever they work for the state. And then the other big one is where you have a non-state actor, a group or an individual, perhaps a terrorist group, perhaps a, a patriotic hacker, perhaps a private company that is working based upon the instructions of the state. The state says, go do this operation or operating pursuant to what's called the effective control of the state. I like to think of effective control has the power of the state to direct the group to do things it doesn't want to do, or to tell the group, don't do this operation, even, and, and the group will not, even though it wants to. It effectively controls those operations. Now, during the pandemic, one of the states that was very vocal uh, was the Netherlands, and in a public forum, in a, in a United Nations uh, meeting, they really pointed the finger at other states, that other states using the language of international law, that other states are pretty active in this space. Now, what if you have a non-state actor and you cannot attribute that non-state actor's activities, cyber operations to a state, they're operating independently, they are not operating pursuant to instructions, they are not under the effective control of another state, if that's the case, 
we're not talking about internationally wrongful acts because one of the elements is missing. And so there we would look to the domestic law of a state that enjoys jurisdiction. And when I say jurisdiction, I mean jurisdiction under international law, jurisdiction to make laws, jurisdiction to enforce those laws, and then jurisdiction to adjudicate those laws. There's an entire body of law uh, that governs jurisdiction from an international perspective. So if you have, just as an example, if you have bad guys conducting operations against healthcare facilities, the state of their nationality will have jurisdiction. The state where they are located will have jurisdiction to outlaw the conduct. The state into which the operation is conducted may have jurisdiction to outlaw the conduct. The states that are affected by that particular activity may have jurisdiction. So in any one case, you may have two or three or more states which enjoy domestic law jurisdiction under international law for that activity. But we're gonna focus on activities here that are classic international law, internationally wrongful acts where it's a state that is behind the operation. So the question Marco and I uh, were working with, our, our, our core question was, what sorts of violations were these operations, assuming attribution to a state? Now, the most likely, without any doubt, the most likely violation is a violation of the sovereignty of the, opera, of the state into which the operation is conducted. We're assuming a remotely conducted operation into a state and that state's sovereignty is violated as a result of that operation. Now, not every, obviously, not every operation that's remotely conducted, cyber operation that's remotely conducted is a violation of the sovereignty of the target state. For instance, espionage is not a violation of international law. To violate sovereignty, you need one of two things. The first are effects on the territory of the state, because the state is sovereign. The state has a right to control what happens on its territory. So to the extent that there are effects as a result of the cyber operation, then it might be a violation of sovereignty. Everyone agrees, everyone agrees that that, uh, that takes a position that there is a rule of sovereignty. I'll get to that in a moment. Everyone agrees that if it affects health, if it affects life, if it makes people sick, then in that case, it's a violation of sovereignty. So a simple example here, we have a ransomware attack. It freezes up a medical facility and has a result of the medical facilities systems being frozen, ransomware attack. There's a denial of treatment. So you will have predictable foreseeable effects that would violate sovereignty on that basis. And I wanna emphasize that those effects may be indirect. So the cyber operation may be, for example, uh, as I have here, for example, against the virus testing information. I can't get online to find out whether or not, uh, or find out where I can be tested, whether I can be tested and so forth, because the site is down. If the predictable result is an increase in the number of affected individuals uh, by the virus because they weren't tested and maybe became more severe and so forth, if you can create that hook, create that connection where you say health was affected, you have a pretty clear violation of sovereignty. Moreover, not only is sovereignty by violated by virtue of the effect on individuals, but it's violated by virtue of the effect on things. And in this case, in the case of a pandemic, you would be talking about healthcare systems. There's pretty broad consensus that if there is a, a cyber, remotely conducted cyber operation, and it permanently affects the targeted cyber infrastructure, in this case, in a hospital, for example, then that's a violation of sovereignty. So, you know, you, you, you conduct an operation, now your systems are down and they're down in a relatively permanent way. You need to replace them, you need to repair them, violation of sovereignty. It's at that point that consensus over the type of operation that violates sovereignty breaks down. 
So let's assume we have disruption of websites, but you, you can't really say that anyone became ill or that the, that the, the, the infection rate went up. If you can't say that, it's unclear whether operations below permanent loss of functionality, uh, whether they qualify as a sovereignty violation. Assume you're engaged in an operation against, or there's an operation against a hospital's equipment, but it doesn't permanently break. It's a denial of service, a temporary denial of service, and it's not really causing physical harm to any individual. In that case, the law is unclear. The jury is out. There is general agreement that espionage is not a violation of international law. Obviously, we have large organizations and that's their job. But if the espionage in some way leads to one of those results, uh, then in that case, you would have a violation of sovereignty. So the example here is, and this actually was a real world example, this is the Hammersmith example, you have research ongoing, there's a cyber operation against it, you can't directly tie it to, uh, to physical loss or injury, suffering and so forth, but as a result of that operation to ensure the integrity of the data, they needed to recheck all of their data which in turn slowed the progress of the vaccine research, which in turn predictably meant that the vaccine was not on the street as quickly as it could have been. At least for Marco and myself, we felt this was a violation of sovereignty. Now, uh, for those of you who work in the cyber field, you will know that there is currently a debate over whether there is even a rule of sovereignty. There is one country in the world, it is the United Kingdom that in 2018 took the position that there is no rule of sovereignty. I have to tell you, I think that's simply the wrong, uh, wrong as a matter of law. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't even think it's debatable. And so far, no other state has adopted the British position to the extent that states are adopting positions. Every single one of them has adopted the position that there is a rule of sovereignty, and that includes NATO. In the most recent NATO cyber doctrine, there is an acknowledgement that sovereignty may be violated by virtue of a remotely conducted operation. The United Kingdom reserved on that particular statement. So there's a reservation in the front of the, uh, in the, front of the cyber doctrine, the NATO cyber doctrine, that the United, uh, the United Kingdom does not agree with that. So sovereignty on the basis of territoriality is one way these cyber operations can violate international law. There's a second way that it can, again, tied to the rule of sovereignty. Not only can you not cause effects on another state's territory, whatever the threshold is, you may not, by virtue of the rule of sovereignty, interfere with what are known as inherently governmental functions. What are inherently governmental functions? They're functions that governments and governments alone perform or have the authority to allow others to perform for them. Now, when I talk to foreign audiences, as I was talking to one just this morning, there is this sense that healthcare is an inherently governmental function. It is not, because in our country, healthcare is provided by the private sector in many cases, in most cases. So it's not inherently governmental to provide healthcare, but what is inherently governmental is managing a health crisis of this magnitude. So we have the pandemic to the extent that a cyber operation in any way disrupts the planning for the response of the nation to the pandemic, in any way disrupts, interferes with the execution of the nation's crisis management plan, then that's a violation of that nation's sovereignty. And you can see for yourself here examples. The state wants to disseminate information on COVID-19 and, and the system is brought down and the state cannot disseminate that information. For Mike Schmidt, that's a clear violation of sovereignty. Medical equipment, you remember early on, we have problems with the dissemination, the, uh, of, of medical equipment, key medical equipment. Uh, 
if, for example, there's a cyber operation that disrupted that distribution, that would be a clear violation of sovereignty on this basis, even if it did not cause the qualifying effects that I've just talked about. Now, the second likely violation by of, of international law by an operation interfering with healthcare, targeting healthcare, is intervention. Intervention has two elements. The offense of intervention has two elements. The first is it's intervention into a state's internal or external affairs. What are those? Those are activities that international law doesn't touch. It's the state's business. To give you a simple example, language policy in a country is the state's business. Diplomacy, diplomatic positions, state's business. I believe, Marco believes, that determining how to respond to a health crisis is an internal affair of the state. International law does not tell states how it is supposed to do that. So our response in this country was very different than the response in China, which was very different than the response in Estonia, because international law doesn't govern that. So to the extent there's an interference with an activity like pandemic response that's left to a state, there may be a violation. However, the interference must be coercive in nature. It must cause the state to do something that it doesn't want to do or keep the state from doing something that it does want to do. So to the extent a state has a plan and is executing that plan, if a cyber operation by or attributable to another state interferes with the execution of that plan, then it's going to be a breach of the primary rule of intervention. By the way, it is probably also going to be a breach of sovereignty on the basis of interference with an inherently governmental function, because not only is pandemic response internal affairs of a state, it's also an inherently governmental function. So there would be a violation in both cases. The third likely violation that Marco and I came up with was use of force. If you conduct operations targeting uh, pandemic response, uh, software, hardware, if you do that and it results in deaths or a significant, a significant increase in infection rates, it's pretty clear to me that if conducted by a state or attributable to state, that's a use of force. And by the way, it's not only physical damage, it may be again here, loss of functionality. So if you conduct an operation and it's against, uh, against hardware, it doesn't work and you have to replace it. To me, if there's a significant degree of, of impact there, then that's gonna be a violation of the prohibition on the use of force found in customary law and Article 2, subparagraph 4 of the UN Charter. And if it gets bad enough, then it may even rise to the level of an armed attack, which gives a state a right to respond kinetically or by cyber means to defend itself. The right of self-defense found in Article 51 of the UN Charter and customary law. I do have a but see the US position. Most of the world says, a use of force is at this level, but before you get the right of self-defense, it has to be really bad. The International Court of Justice in a famous case, Nicaragua said that a, an armed attack, the point where you have the right to respond must be the most grave form of use of force. So here we're talking a fair number of deaths or a lot of damage before you could have the right of self-defense. The United States does not accept that view. The United States has always said all uses of force are armed attacks. And so therefore, if we have a cyber operation uh, against our, our, our health sector, and we can say there have been deaths or injuries or damage to property that's significant, then for the Americans, we would say we immediately have the right of self-defense and that self-defense could be kinetic in nature. And the last of the violations we looked at with regard to targeting uh, the health sector 
had to do with international human rights law, because under Article 6 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, people have a right to life. And Marco and I felt uh, this was our view. I don't know that it's everyone's view. We felt if you even knowingly and intentionally increase the risk of a loss of life, that's a violation. And we also noted, has, has the uh, uh, various committees at the UN, that there is an obligation to respect the right to the enjoyment of health. So it's not only if, if, state, if a state conducts an operation that in some way results in loss of life, risk to life, or causes the health of an individual to be affected, then that would be a violation of their human rights. Now we need to be careful here because human rights are really about a state and the individuals it controls. So we're not talking yet about state A conducting a cyber operation against the health sector in state B and affecting the human rights of individuals in state B. We're talking about in your own state. And so the example here is you're blocking access to signing up for, for vaccines or signing up for testing in a minority area. Area. In other words, the state is actually conducting cyber operations that make it harder for a particular minority group, a particular ethnic group, particular religious group to secure vaccines, testing, and other health care. That would be a clear violation of the human rights of those individuals. The big question in law, that's pretty clear. The big question in law is, yeah, but the state A have a human rights obligation to individuals in state B. So state A conducts these cyber operations or a non-state actor operating on the instructions of state A conducts these cyber operations and they result in a loss of life or they result in illness, they result in an increased risk of, 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 of getting the virus, of getting COVID-19. Is that a violation of the human rights of those individuals by state A. This is a long-standing question in human rights law. It's the issue of the extraterritoriality of obligations. Traditionally, traditionally, you only owe human rights obligations to individuals that you control or individuals on territory you control. So individuals you control abroad would be detainees, for example, or territory, everyone on the United States, the United States owes uh, human rights obligations to everyone on our territory. The question is, what about those other people? There is an emerging view. Marco is probably the world's foremost advocate of this view. I'm a little bit skeptical. I'm on the fence. But the emerging view is, listen, it's not about control over that individual. And it's not about control over territory. It's about control over the enjoyment of the right. So if individuals have a right to health, and you conduct operations into another state, but those operations, for example, make it impossible for them to figure out where to go get the vaccine and they can track the virus, then you've, by this view, by Marco's view, and, and it is becoming uh, the, the view, uh, by this view, you violated the human rights of those individuals. And the Human Rights Committee at the UN has actually spoken to this issue. And they've said, listen, this is, it's, it's common sense. Are you telling me, this is what the Human Rights Committee has said, are you telling me I can't do this activity, I can't affect the rights of people on my territory, but I can affect the right, the right to health, the right to life of people on another state's territory. Again, uh, my personal view is we probably aren't quite there yet, but if Jeff invites me back in 10 years, we may very well be the point where that is the prevailing view. All right, misinformation, disinformation, false information, and intentionally false information. We saw a lot of it, uh, some by states, some at, at points by individuals who actually represent our own government. Uh, you have some of the claims here, some of the claims are comical in the UK. I spend a lot of time in the UK. Uh, the rumor was, you know, 5G masks, the 5G masks they're putting up, that causes, it causes COVID. Some of it has been very tragic. In Iran, for example, on social media, the 
false information, misinformation went out that you could ingest methanol and this would keep you from getting the, the illness. Remember our own bleach incident. And in Iran, a lot of people, nearly 500 people ingested methanol and died as a result of that misinformation. So the misinformation is a big problem. We saw a lot of it. If it is state misinformation, then most of the rules that we've been talking about kick in. Why would a state put out fake information? Well, maybe they're just making a mistake, but maybe it's intentional. Externally, they may pump information into another country because they want to sow dissent and discontent. The Russians are continually doing that in our country. Or it may be internal. You may be putting out wrong information because you want to show, oh, there's really no crisis. This was very common in many countries. Uh, Brazil, for example, the leaders were saying, listen, there's no problem. You shouldn't wear a mask. Why should you wear a mask? Mocking others for wearing a mask or getting the vaccine. It may be to uh, create the impression of competence. It may be to shift blame on and on and on. There are lots of reasons why you would engage, a state would engage in misinformation or disinformation campaigns, either in one's own country or abroad. And then the state, because it has control over censorship, can really make it bad. So it puts out misinformation and then uses censorship, as was done in Brazil, for example, uses censorship to keep truthful information off the street. If you are directing this at your own country, it's a real problem. It's a real problem because people look to the state to try to understand how to deal with the pandemic. So it's very nefarious. Is it a human rights violation? Well, you have the right to life and the right to health that I've already talked about. And you also have a right under human rights law to seek and impart, to seek and transmit information. This is found in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So you see here, this is a very old comment from 2000 uh, from the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights at the UN. It says, listen, there's a right to respect health, so you can't censor health-related information that's valuable, can't withhold it. Uh, you can't misrepresent it. You have a duty to educate your population and to, uh, to talk to them about the health crisis. The UN doesn't make law, nor do, they, do the various committees authoritatively interpret law, but this is the view of many human rights experts, that states must not give misinformation to their own population if there's any risk of health to health at all. And if you're directing that in another state, then you look to the rules we've just talked about. It might be, if you're engaged in misinformation, it might be a violation of sovereignty because the misinformation might actually result in people refraining from treatment, people getting the wrong treatment that will have health implications. It might interfere with the handling of a crisis. You create a website and the website gives the wrong information on where to go get vaccines. Or you create a website and the website counters information on the state's website, pandemic response website. And it could also, in the same way that we talked about earlier, it could be an intervention if it's interfering with crisis management. So you've got some examples here. You know, you're announcing a particular hospital is no longer receiving patients. It is receiving patients, but people don't go there now or misinformation about testing sites and so forth. Be a little bit careful. You have to have these consequences. The mere fact that the state, either with its own population or another population, is putting out fake news, if you will, is not a violation of international law unless one of these consequences uh, manifests. And then finally, very briefly, what are the obligations of a state in this sort of situation? where you have misinformation, where you have foreign cyber operations conducted by governments, by non-state actors upon the instructions of a government under the effective control of a government or by non-state actors acting on their own. What are the affirmative obligations of a state? Well, in human rights, it's actually fairly complicated. And so in human rights, Marco and I came up with what we believe to be uh, the key 
the key obligations of states under human rights law, because human rights law requires respect, it requires states to respect, in other words, don't violate, respect and protect. And protect is what's called a positive obligation. It's an affirmative obligation. You have a negative obligation not to violate human rights, and you have a positive obligation to protect human rights of those individuals under your control. So you can see some of the measures that uh, we, we believe human rights law requires of states. You know, prevent hostile cyber operations if you can, if it's feasible, if it's affecting the delivery of health care. To promote accurate information, to suppress misinformation if that misinformation is placing life or, or, or health at risk. And there's some duty to regulate the activities of the corporate sector, uh, particular social media, and to cooperate with social media to ensure that truthful information that will safeguard the health of the people under your control is put out there. You need to be a little bit careful because especially when we're talking about misinformation and so forth, there are, there are human rights to the freedom of expression. And the freedom of expression includes putting out information that is simply wrong. Putting out wrong information is often protected speech unless it has consequences like affecting the health of individuals. And in fact, we need to be careful because sometimes the information that's being put out that the state wants to suppress is actually very useful. And there's a very famous case, the, the Chinese doctor who, was, who identified the spread of the virus. Of course, China shut him down, censored him so that he could not tell the world this is happening. But that's an example of an abuse of a state's authority. And then if you are going to limit misinformation, disinformation, human rights law, because of these rights of expression, imposes some pretty strict conditions. It has to be prescribed by law. In other words, it has to be when you take this action, when the state takes this action, you must have the legislative authority to take the action that shuts down expression. It has to be necessary to pursue a legitimate aim. So a legitimate aim is not suppressing information that the opposing political party is supporting. It is, for example, public health. And then it must be proportionate because you are suppressing a human right in order to advance a human right, suppressing expression in order to advance health. And then finally, the last obligation uh, that I wanted to talk about was due diligence. It's an obligation under general international law, and it's currently somewhat controversial. I believe, I've written on it many times, I believe it is a rule of international law. Not everyone does. And in fact, one state, Israel, recently came out and took the position that there is no rule of due diligence in the cyber context. Other states that have spoken to the issue have either said, we're not quite sure, Australia being an example, or there certainly is a rule of due diligence, uh, France, the Netherlands, Estonia, a number of other countries. I'm of the view there is a rule of due diligence and it says this. It says, listen, if you enjoy sovereign rights, then you also shoulder sovereign obligations. Rights aren't free. And one of those obligations, if you have the right to control this territory, one of the obligations is to control that territory, to ensure that harmful cyber operations by non-state actors or other states are not launched from your territory. Now, it's a rather limited obligation. It only applies to uh, operations obviously that you know about because you don't know about them, you can't stop them. It only applies to ongoing operations. It doesn't require states to take any measures to prevent hostile operations. It only applies to operations that affect the legal rights of other states like sovereignty. Uh, and it only requires states to do what it is feasible for them to do. Uh, example here, we have a terrorist group operating from a state's territory. Uh, the state must, if it can, uh, put an end to those operations. If the terrorist group is conducting counter uh, 
uh, COVID response operations that are endangering the health or some other way affecting the legal rights of the target state. Due diligence, controversial. I'm pretty sure though, we're gonna see states increasingly, I hope so, embrace the rule of due diligence. I think the pandemic's gonna help us because states will want to be able to say to other states, hey, you have a legal obligation. Yeah, I realize that the bet, remember what Putin's saying. Uh, oh, those guys, I don't know who those guys are conducting the operations. Did it with regard to the pandemic or any other hostile operations. You want to be able to say to the other state, listen, you're violating international law if you don't put an end to these hostile operations. And with that, Jeff has asked me to keep about 20 minutes of time. This is to show that once upon a time, I was at the zoo and still support Air Force. This is Air Force touchdown over the uh, West Point team. Okay, I'll take questions. Jeff, over to you. No, that's uh, fantastic. Um, hey, I really appreciate that was an, an excellent, there, there's something about kind of new sets and circumstances or global conditions that can really force you to clarify positions on international law. So uh, very interesting. I'll go ahead and kick it off with the question that I um, kept coming back to. And that was some similar discussions that we had um, during uh, 2016 following the election with the election interference um, and the question of prohibited interventions. And one of the, the factors that was pointed to by many who suggested that the, the Russians during that election interference were guilty of a prohibited intervention was the intelligence assessment that the intent of the operation was to undermine the faith of Americans in their democratic process. Um, and as I think about um, some of these operations you suggest, or you, uh, you highlight, excuse me, um, could a loss of confidence in a government's ability to respond to a pandemic or a healthcare crisis, could that be a condition that would raise um, uh, a prohibited inter intervention, as opposed to looking at you know, the specific things, mechanisms that were, were impacted, more that broad question of, hey, I just don't trust my government anymore to be able to do this. And, the, and it was a result of these malicious cyber operations. Yeah, so uh, it's a great question, Jeff. The loss of confidence, I would say no, that that would not suffice uh, to qualify as intervention. But, 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 if the loss of confidence has the effect of causing the government to change policy or to be unable to execute the policy as it wishes, then in that particular case, it would be that consequence that would qualify it as intervention. So not the loss of confidence, but the consequences of the loss of confidence. So, uh, they conduct operations. We're trying to get everyone vaccinated. Another state is putting out misinformation uh, with regard to the viability, the effectiveness of the vaccines. Uh, I saw reports today that you know some people believe vaccines cause, for example, uh, premature death or uh, miscarriages. If you're doing that kind of thing, and as a result, the country cannot respond as it wishes to, then I think that that is coercion, it's coercive, it's, it's, it's blocking the state's ability to execute health, a health plan, which is clearly in its uh, internal affairs, what we would call domain reserve. So one step removed in my view, Jeff. No, and I think I agree, um, but it, it is it just, I kept hearkening back to that over and over again, because um, I think that was kind of another, the first time we really saw large scale election interference through cyber means at least, um, and, and how it uh, stimulated a lot of the, these questions. Um, I, another question I thought of as, as we were going along um, and this gets back to your question of sovereignty. Um, you know, sometimes we talk about how uh, major global events have a way of pushing international law in certain areas and subjects. Have you seen anything um, or do you think uh, that these operations against pandemic response and healthcare facilities might drive some states towards that position of sovereignty as a standalone rule, or perhaps those that already have further articulating the circumstances under when um, there might be a breach of that violation? 
Yeah, the answer to your question is absolutely. Um, and I can give you an example. And the example was something that we, we wrote about together. Uh, and uh, I think we wrote about it together. Uh, that was the WannaCry operation, the ransomware operation conducted by the North Koreans. It's difficult to say that that was an, in by the way, for everyone that shut down the National Health Service to an extent for a short period in the United Kingdom. The Brits had by this time uh, were moving towards there's no such thing as sovereignty and soon thereafter, they would say there's no sovereignty. The question is, well, without sovereignty, what was it? It was an intervention because it was a ransomware attack designed not to change any policy with respect to the National Health Service, but just to get cash. It was a criminal activity. Mike Schmidt, that seems to me though that that operation was a violation of sovereignty because it caused pretty severe effects throughout the country. You couldn't, you couldn't get health care for a while. So I think people seeing that event and subsequent events are seeing the utility of the rule of sovereignty. Um, certainly, certainly in the pandemic, the most likely violation by other states is sovereignty. So currently the trend, Jeff, is very much towards states uh, coming online and publicly announcing that they support sovereignty. The, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the only state that has indicated otherwise is the United Kingdom and even, even NATO, even NATO, you know, the United Kingdom's 29 closest partners uh, embraces the notion of sovereignty. Everyone seems to understand that they, you need to be able to condemn the other side, not just for being naughty, but for being unlawful, that there's value in, in being able to name and shame. So I, I think with every serious event, whether it's, uh, you know, an operation against the pipeline, whatever it is, it's pushing the law more towards embracing sovereignty. And by the way, also embracing due diligence. Yeah, that raises uh, an interesting question of had those effects against the national health system occurred during the pandemic, I wonder if that might have changed uh, how the UK government had viewed that. I mean, wow. there would have had to have been a huge uproar, um, you know, if, if the circumstances had, had been changed just a little bit. Yeah, no, I mean, and then, uh, then you might even get to the point where it was a use of force because, uh, you know, uh, it's one thing not to have enough ventilators. It's quite another to have none of the ventilators you have work. Uh, so yeah, you might have even had a use of force, but certainly. And I think, you know, I just, this morning I was over talking to a group of international officers at, uh, at DILS, the Defense Institute, and any, anyone from a small country wants to be able to say that big countries that are cyber capable, that are messing in our cyberspace, have violated sovereignty. I think the whole sovereignty debate is really unfortunate. It was wrong as a matter of law, in my view, and it's detracted from the discussion we should be having, which is where's the threshold? Because it's a pretty fair question to say, the French say, you just cause effects in France, that's a violation of our sovereignty. Many people would say that's an extreme view, but we ought to be having that discussion. And this pandemic would have set it up beautifully. You know, which of these types of operations would you consider to be a violation of sovereignty? Right. Okay, we have a question from our audience. Um, the question, you argue that health is not inherently governmental due to the fact that some governments leave healthcare provision to the private sector. Might healthcare be inherently governmental in one state but not in another based upon the expectation of its citizens? So the answer is no. Uh, the term inherently governmental has understood in international humanitarian uh, international law is uh, something that is inherently governmental in all states. So you know elections are inherently governmental in all states. National security in all states. So when you get to something where it is in one state and another then you don't, you can't, there's not a breach of sovereignty. So a, a breach of sovereignty is a breach of sovereignty is a breach of sovereignty, if you will. It's a good question. We get that uh, an awful lot. Okay. Um, one question that, the, that I, as during your discussion on espionage, um, 
and, and this is something <laughs> I, I have heard it argued that espionage that category, which is not per se prescribed by international law, is limited to national security related information. Um, do you agree with that position? And if so, is a vaccine for a pandemic within the parameters? So I'm thinking, you know, as opposed to, um, you know, information about a new weapon system, which would obviously be covered under espionage, instead, um, you know, intellectual property related to music or something like that, that would have no relationship whatsoever to national security. Yeah, so no, espionage is espionage is espionage. It doesn't matter if it's for commercial purposes or national security purposes, unless, unless there is a separate rule governing that particular type of information. For example, intellectual property. Right. There are international law rules that are specific to intellect, intellectual property. Uh, and, and I want to hasten to add that SBI, I, I was speaking about that just this morning. Uh, a lot of states would like espionage to be unlawful because they are the target of espionage. Uh, sometimes from us, they point out whenever I go abroad. Um, but if the consequences of espionage are such that you have a qualifying effect, then it is unlawful. It's not that it's espionage, it's that the way the operation is, is carried out. So in, in the case that w this is a real world case, you're going after vaccine research they figure out that you were inside their systems. They can't continue the research until they verify all their data. You just slowed down the development of vaccine. To me, that's unlawful, not because of its character as espionage, but rather because of the consequences.